in New Orleans, they have these jazz bands that play on the street. And they might have like uh, just a couple of uh, members in the band. They might have a dozen members in the band. And what I, I was watching or listening to this in both, watching and listening to this one band. And, you know, they would all come together. You know what I mean? Like they're all playing together. But then they would all go their separate ways musically. You know what I mean? They, you know, yeah. it didn't seem like they were playing together anymore, but they were. But then they would come back together again. And then, then they would separate. And it was really cool. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, Stefan was talking about imagination. You know, these people, when they separated, they're exploring their imagination, their creativity. Yeah. All right. But then they had to get back together again you know, to share that creativity, but just, if nothing else, just a level set to make sure that they're a band still, okay, before yeah. they go off and do their thing again. So if if I were to think of a metaphor for uh, trying to get back together face-to-face, but also a hybrid approach where you al- are also allowed to be creative separately, I think that's going to be the best mix at some time in the future. Welcome to The Outliers Inn, produced by the Operational Excellence Society and sponsored by Zonotech Consulting Group International, with your hosts, Joseph Paris and David Schneider. Well, hey there, folks. Welcome to another edition of The Outliers Inn. I'm one of your hosts, Mule Schneider, and uh, joining me is uh, JP. Hello, JP. How are you? Hey, Mule. How's it going, man? Man, it is uh, nippy cold outside here in Virginia, but uh, I'm glad that we haven't gotten any of that snow that uh, was supposed to hit uh, New England uh, this past week. Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here in upstate New York, uh, somewhat stranded, and I'll, I'll share that story in a second. But man, it has been cold. I mean, like, you know, minus five, you know, the wind chills getting down to whatever the heck it is. I, you know, to the point where Celsius and, and Fahrenheit are about the same. And uh, man, just, just really, really the kind that when you walk outside, your nostrils freeze and that first couple of breaths are like painful. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Deep freeze cold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. so it's, it's reminiscent of um, a January that I spent in um, South Sioux City, Nebraska, where um, it, I was in a freezer and a cooler, and we were going outside where it was 10 degrees because that was warmer than it was inside the freezer. <laughs> crazy. That's crazy stuff. That's crazy. Yeah. So my, my entire trip, I, I got to tell you, it's been a, almost like a planes, trains, and automobiles kind of trip. All right. I have this project out in Denver that I just started and it looks like it's going to be an ongoing thing taking a couple of uh, uh, weeks a month. Maybe we'll meet in Denver on one of your your crossover sometime. Um, So, uh, you know, I was going to spend a couple of days here in New York on the way back, uh, you know, mostly because I have a project in upstate New York with a battery company too. So spend a couple of days here. I was going to leave um, uh, New York on Wednesday and go back to uh, Germany. But my wife and son decided they're going to go to Poland. Uh, you know, in Poland, I always, uh, you know, tell everybody that Poland is the Florida of Europe. They don't have any restrictions. They're free and clear. All right. Right. So they're going to go to Poland and no sense in me coming back on Wednesday to a house that's empty and sitting around and you know, what for. Right. So, uh, and I don't even have a car. We don't only have one car. So it's like, you know, uh, so I'm going to make my flight back for Saturday, because they're supposed to be back on Sunday from Poland. I'll get uh, back on, on, you know, I'll leave here Saturday, get into to Germany on Sunday. Ha- happy fr- family reunion, right? So here it comes, and I'm looking at the weather, and they got this nor'easter planned for Saturday. Mm-hmm. And what I don't feel like doing is driving three hours to Newark, only to have my flight canceled, and then have to scramble to find a place to stay in Newark. And by the way, nobody stays in Newark, right? So I decide that I'm going to push my flight out one day, from Saturday to Sunday. So far, so good. It goes like planned. My flight would have been canceled or was canceled. I was going to take on Saturday. So guess what? 
so far the plan's working. But I wake up Sunday and I get a, a message from my wife. Uh, her and my son have COVID. Oh. Okay. So uh, I don't have COVID and I'm not in Germany and I'm in upstate New York. Uh, and I'm supposed to go to, uh, to uh, London on next Sunday for a uh, workshop on Monday. All right. So I don't want to fly into this mess, catch COVID, have some PCR thing in, in London when I arrive. Next thing I know, I have to spend 14 days in some London you know, hotel jail. Right. And, uh, like all this stuff is just no bueno. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I decide I'm going to spend uh, until Friday, Friday now, here in upstate New York. And uh, of course, it caused some scheduling consternation. Uh, but by the time I get back to Germany, you know, it, yeah, I still might catch COVID, right? But I won't catch it from them because they'll be out of the contagious, the contagious right. zone. Uh, and hopefully that will all work. Well, how are they feeling? Uh, Anton, the youngest, was uh, feeling run down. Um, you know what I mean? A little lethargic. Uh, my wife has got, uh, I guess, uh, the waterfalls coming out of her head. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, they were, they were vaxxed, just not boosted. Mm -hmm. Um and so, yeah. So, that's so you know, well, uh, as I've been reading and studying and looking at the numbers, yeah, because my client, a lot of people, a lot of companies got really walloped with uh, absenteeism uh, the past three, four weeks. And that's shown up in various places in the supply chain. Um, for a week and a half, uh, chicken was kind of difficult to find in certain areas of the East Coast because several of the large chicken processing plants in Maryland and out on the Delmarva were shut down because they didn't have enough people to operate. And, you know, somebody in the family had it and the rest of the family had to shelter, you know, had to spend their five days right. uh, and get their testing before they could come back to work. Uh, so, you know, vast big chunks of the supply chain stopped for, about three to four days because they didn't have enough people to make the business operate. And it's had an interesting trickle effect. Uh, you know, uh, my wife lamented she wasn't able to find lemon juice in three different stores. And so, okay, where's the lemon juice? So we're starting to see pockets of stuff that you just can't find now because the inventory is not there. The demand is stripped. What was sitting there is inventory on the shelves and it's just not getting made. Right. So, so it could be worse. Some interesting it, things. It, it, it could, could be. be. It could be worse. People could be uh, fretting about toilet paper again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's not, you know, there's not, the, there's, there's inventory exhaustion, but there's not panic buying. Right. You know what I mean, that's, that's gone. So it's, uh, there's a complete like difference with it. It's inventory exhaustion and it's not widespread. And, you know, it is, it's pockets within the supply chain and everybody's kind of going through it at the same time because, you know, the numbers went up and now they're going back down. Yeah. Things will loosen up, but yeah, uh, it's, it's robot season for me. Yeah. I, I've been watching. I've yeah. Been watching. So, so how's, how's the robots going? Oh, the robots are going good. You know, the uh, kids, the game this year, all the games, all the robot games that we participate in always have a climb, some sort of, uh, uh, in the last 30 seconds, the robot has to ascend. Either it has to reach up and grab something and, and pull itself up, or it's got to uh, hoist itself up on platforms, one or the other. And you get different points. Uh, and, you know, if you can climb to the top bar consistently, you're probably going to win most of the matches because it's going to be something that it, it's a stretch goal. Sure. Uh, and so a big part of our strategy this year is, is, is being able to climb at least to the high bar and then, you know, reach up and get to the mid bar. And then there's a high bar and then there's the, a higher bar called traverse. And so the basic goal was reach to the mid bar, which we demonstrated on Saturday we could do. Uh, and that was the video that I posted on, on Facebook. 
And they've already got their mechanism ready to put onto this test robot to then reach to the next bar and grab onto it. And then they got to let go of the first bar. So the robot's got to reach up, grab the first bar, reach out to the next bar and grab onto it, then let go of the first bar, pull itself up, grab, and then reach out again to grab the next bar, let go. Sort of like Tarzan, and, like and, a monkey bars. Exactly. It's got a, you know, you got a 120 pound machine max uh, plus the weight of its battery and bumpers. So probably about 150 pounds max, these machines ha- trying to do monkey bar climb. And uh, uh, the other part of it is, is, is um, you've got to pick up these oversized balls that are about nine inches in size. They're like tennis balls. They have the same yeah. fur on the outside as a tennis ball, but they're nine inches in diameter and they're hard. They'll compress a little bit because they're inflated on the inside, but you know, that's, that's what they do. Um, I might be able to hit those on the tennis court. Yeah. Yeah. You might be able to, I I might be able to. And typically you see a lot of these solutions where the robots go and they use contraptions of rollers and belts to ingest cargo because that's the balls are always cargo. And every year the cargo is a different size and different consistency. Two years ago, we called the cargo lemons. They were real, they were like oversized Nerf balls. Yeah. And so if you used really, you know, soft wheels, you couldn't deal with these squishy things. Now it's like, oh no, soft wheels work. So a lot of the robots that we're seeing do these contraptions that suck the ball in and internally ingest it and then shoot it out the top or do something with it that way. We're going at a different approach. We've actually designed um, using uh, silicone rubber uh, grippers that we can use to clasp onto the ball and then an arm. It's a classic industrial robot design, but it's not a uh, multi-joint arm. It's got two joints. This joint, or actually three. There's this joint, there's this joint, and then there's that joint. And uh, what we've done is, is everything in the, they typically overbuild everything, you know, so we, over oh, we got, yeah, well, it's, it's also use way too much material, you know, right. a three pound piece of metal where six ounces would have, would have done. You know, uh, that's what I said, uh, over engineering, but of course, they have a coach whose uh, name is Schneider, so uh, you know, that would well, (laughs) actually, you know, I I look at it, I always look at what they do and go, uh, how do you do that with half the material and then walk away? And you know, now you're using twice as much material as you should be, so how do you do that with half the material? But uh, the um, the soft rippers were actually. Uh, building the molds, designed the molds and printed them. Uh, They started the print 22 hour print job, uh, print the molds, and then we'll mix the rubber and mold our own grips. And so that allows us to change gripper designs, but the clasp and then we, the clasp mechanism and this, all the mechanics is figured out. It's just what, what, is the pattern what do we want to do with the hands for the robot right and be able to change designs and just bolt on and bolt off and test different designs because uh the big thing is when you're in competition you want to grab that ball and not let go of it until you right. want to let go of it right right, right. and uh, uh we're finding that we're able to come up with a lot uh, a lot more options this way and how we want to play than we would if we were internally ingesting the ball and shooting the ball out. Right, right, right. And, and figured we eliminated at least four motors out of the system. But the big challenge is, is those two pistons that go up and down and pull the robot, do the real big pull on the robot. Those pistons take a lot of compressed air. We got to put seven air tanks on board to have enough air capacity to be able to operate the pistons to do the three steps of climb and hydraulics wouldn't uh 
can't use hydraulics. Ones. Can't use hydraulics. Got to use pneumatics. Uh, and all the pneumatics uh, okay. have to be common off the shelf parts. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like fun though. It is. It is. We're keeping, we've got a, a pretty consistent 50, 55 kids showing up on Monday nights, Thursday nights, and then they come in and work eight hours on Saturday. Right. And, and now then, you're in uh, Virginia with a new governor and, uh, you know, what's the rules there? Are they, they, they lose. Oh, the up? school, the school board gave the governor the middle finger, took him to court and said, no, we're going to continue to make the kids wear masks. Uh, that's too bad. And you know what? The kids are, the kids are, you know, they're, yes, they would like to not have to wear the masks, but they're so used to it now. And, you know, uh, it's been it's been a challenge sometimes to be able to communicate, but imagine this: you're in a engineering lab with 50 high school kids. Imagine, uh, you know, the noise level anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, what was fun this past Saturday was is I worked with uh, five girls, two sophomore, three freshmen, um, putting together the joint for the bottom of the piston. So a fairly simple part, but it had nine operations. And so we, and they were just told, yeah, you got to come up with the, the joint, come up with the bottom joint. And so I worked with them to, all right, what do we need it to do? Where does it need to connect? How does it connect? Okay, now we know that. Well, well what material do we have to use? How do we want to do it? And we walked through it and actually simplified the design and then none of them had ever used the vertical mill before. And so I had a little impromptu class on using a manual vertical mill uh, to machine out a U out of a piece of uh, billet aluminum and then do the drill hole that we needed to, to do the side drill. Are so. you able to do any uh, 3D printing instead? Because that, that sounds counterintuitive to off the shelf stuff. Yeah, well, uh, the, you can fabricate almost all of your own hardware and material. Uh, we do a lot of 3D printing. Uh, the printer lab has 11 printers in it and a laser and a stinter printer, a metal printer. Um, but um, uh, the forces on that, the reason why we use billet is, is that's those are the joints at the bottom of those pistons that are attached to the frame of the robot. Okay. And so want to make it as small, but as robust as possible. And it had to control uh, twisting forces along with the lifting forces because those pistons can, can try to rotate. Yeah, and right, so right, right. that was part of what the design was uh, doing. And so none of those girls had really had... Uh, they hadn't used the mill before. They didn't know how to use the mill. We took them through that. We had went from raw design to finished parts in about three and a half hours and so had it ready to install on the any, robot. Do you guys do any finite element analysis or anything like that? Do you, you like actually analyze how much, uh, you know, torque these things can, or, or do you <laughs> just think there have you're been, using it enough? depends. It depends on the students. And so we've had some students go through and do analysis on what's the torque necessary, you know, in the past torque to lift the robot, how much, you know, they had to calculate, okay, you know, what do I need as torque and speed? Uh, and then that specified what they needed to do for, as a motor and gearbox combination. And so they'll do those calculations uh, fairly normal programming team uh, does an awful lot with, uh, they had been using PID, but now we've got uh, various um, IMU devices. Okay. And so these, uh, these chips, these accelerometers, they're, get, they're getting uh, five axis readback and getting acceleration. And then also, you know, is the robot, you know, what's the orientation of the robot? based off of the um off of the compass so is it facing north is it facing east where's it going and the goal with that programming is is to be able to specify places on the field to go and the operators just then tell the robot go to 12 and robot knows where it is 
and knows where 0.12 is and goes to 0.12. So you really geek out on this stuff, don't you? I do. I do. Yeah, there's, I can tell. there's, <laughs> we've got, we've got uh, four adult mentors working this year that we're all involved in automation or software in some way or another. So I do, you know, I'm an industrial engineer. I do automated storage material handling systems and stuff like that. And so ultimately that's my big geek out. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we've got another guy who uh, works for uh, the Aerospace Corporation and he manages a research and development lab uh, that supports a certain agency in the government that flies things in space. And uh, so he's, you know, talks to the kids about sensors and things like that. And we've been working, you know, you don't do this in one year. It's been right. four years that we've been focused on teaching the programming team how to do some of this work and then integrating the designs earlier in the process. And talking about the designs, talking about the designs. But our big goal is, is, you know, it's build a better team, builds a better robot. So we're really focused. The team's very much focused on engagement. That's why uh, I work very much with the freshman and sophomore students instead of the juniors and seniors. But when I work with the juniors and seniors, Mr. Schneider's kind of a prick. OK, the freshman and sophomore love Mr. Schneider because Mr. Schneider explains everything to them and works with them and everything and they, else. And they don't know any better. And then the juniors <laughs> and seniors come to me remembering Mr. Schneider as a sophomore or as a freshman. And then they're a little surprised when he goes, uh, why are you asking me that question? You know how to look that up. You know better than doing what you're doing. Uh, did you really think about this very long? <laughs> you know, I can. Right. And so, uh, because it's, it's, you know, you got to teach these other kids, you got to keep the pipeline going, but it's also, uh, it's teaching accountability. It's teaching, uh, you know, self-reliance, but also the teamwork and Hey, you've got people standing around doing nothing, Mr. CFO or CMO or COO, uh, get these four or five people to work. And in the past, it was always it was always a challenge. This year, the team's leadership has been very much focused on making sure that everybody's engaged because that's how they keep their membership. It's a secret to you know, a volunteer organization. Everybody needs to feel like they're having fun and they're engaged and they're contributing. And as long as everybody feels that way, you, you keep people. Right. That's the secret so, of any association. So, so let's, uh, I think we should get some of our guests on board. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think so. Let, let's, I, start, I, let's start with Stefan because I got something for him today. Okay. Hey, Stefan. you there? Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey, great for you to join us. I, I uh, was seeing Don yesterday since I'm in upstate New York. All right. And I've been saving this for you. I've actually got another one that I'm going to be bringing back to Germany. Um, but this is one of his beers. Thanks. I, I, I don't know if I saw a bottle for a little bit. <laughs> well, the bottle's it, you know, going in the script. Of you the, the, <laughs> the bottle's in the script, but uh, it does have a American flag bottle cap on it. <laughs> That's nice. But the beer is, oh, let's see if I can get it to show. Yeah, here's the beer. Now, the color isn't coming out quite as much as it should be, but this is a gummy bear beer. And this beer is actually like a very pale green. Green? Green. Yeah, because it's a green. green gummy bears. Ah, lovely. I can, I can look forward to having that bottle in front of me. Yes, so yes. Well, I'm going to get a second bottle. Or I guess now a third bottle, um, <laughs> so that I can send you one and we can have a uh, virtual beer together. Good, thank you. I so to it. I, I, the, I'm, I'm intrigued by this. So in, instead of putting sugar in to feed they put, the, they don't put sugar in though. But they're putting uh, gummy bears in. They are putting gummy bears, right? Yeah. And, so uh, that's supplying sugar for the fermentation, right? 
I, I think they use, uh, you know, gummy bears like they use uh, cherries in some beers, huh? just mm -hmm. for the taste. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gummy um, bears. There we go. <laughs> in this case, you just use green gummy bears, and uh, and so that's why it's got the green uh, pigment. But it's very um, okay. So it's it's not like a beer. Okay, it really actually reminds me more of a cider. Okay, where it's kind of sweet and tangy. Uh, as opposed to what you would normally think of as a beer and oppie and everything else. But unfortunately, Don is, uh, is on client site this entire week. So he couldn't join us and share with us the, uh, the uh, method of his madness, uh, or more in this case, his son's madness. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a refreshing beer. It's a nine percenter. It, you know, it's kind of heavy. You know, so uh, uh, so yeah, it's a it's a heavy beer. I mean, as far as uh, alcohol content is concerned, but I can see it being one of those things that uh, would be great for summer, uh, but would also have a tendency to sneak up on you. You don't know how it is. You a nice summer drink, a little coolness. You know, ninety degrees or you know you know 30 degrees uh celsius and next thing you know you try to stand up and your legs are like a card table and they fold underneath sounds like a beer that i've had in florida called florida man florida man florida man <laughs> <laughs> the key the key question is can you purchase only green gummy bear because you know otherwise you have to tri triage them Oh, yeah, you could buy just one color gummy bear. Is okay. that what your question is? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah, just yeah. buy green green gummy bears. I was not aware. I, they, they don't find them in Europe. Huh? I mean, I'm not aware you can buy them only in one color. Yeah. Um, evident, I can't imagine them, you know, fishing through, you know, 20 bags of gummy bears just to get the green ones out. <laughs> I mean, if they're M&Ms, I could see M&Ms, but uh, yeah. not... not uh, gummy bears. And then the next question is, uh, did you try the red gummy bear or the you know what why green one you know uh, uh, well i guess they have to work through the rainbow i mean uh, they already made one gummy bear beer but i think that was a mixed uh mixed breed if you will uh <laughs> this was green uh i don't know i don't know what the, the mad scientists have planned next but it's a nice little beer and i'll make sure to uh, bring back and send you a bottle so we can have a, a virtual beer together thank you or yeah, even a face to face one day. Who knows? So one day it might happen, right? Exactly. Uh, one day. I don't know when that will be, but <laughs> I would guess uh, probably uh, over uh, the summer months when it gets a little bit warmer and people finally relax. Uh, how are the restrictions where you are? And uh, they, they are speaking or lifting the restriction. You know, this is the, uh, the, the nice term is speaking of lifting. Of course, of course, with no calendar, no schedule. And as we all know, you know, <laughs> schedule is essential. So, yes, <laughs> they are promising, like they've been promising for the last 24 months. So we'll be waiting. Yeah? But apparently, they, 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 you know, the statistical models are explaining that this Omicron variant will decrease significantly in the coming days. And therefore, they will be able to, you know, let uh, people mix and mingle a bit more yeah but who knows you know after there may be a, whatever something else may happen huh? probably yeah, we, have to, we, we have to look forward to what will happen in australia in the in the so in our summer in their winter right right what's next, next well you know it was um interesting i don't know if you followed the papers or the news here in in north america but in canada they've become quite tired of the whole nonsense and all the truckers, and a lot of truckers anyway, um, decided to invade Ottawa. Uh, so my understanding from one of the reports was that the first trucks were getting into Ottawa as the last trucks were leaving Manitoba. And I don't know if you know Canada at all or not, but Manitoba it, it, to Ottawa is, is, we're not talking about a day's drive. We're talking about days, of plural. It's um, 1,400 miles. Yeah. 1500 miles yeah so it's like it's ridiculous right i mean uh anyway uh they decided they're going to up and invade uh, uh ottawa and uh the prime minister of ottawa decided to seek shelter um and instead of <laughs> addressing yes, justin trudeau ran away yes he, <laughs> yes, he ran away run away run away <laughs> 
crave Please. Justin. <laughs> Complete with <laughs> coconuts in the background. Yeah. So, so uh, what else is going on? How, what have you been doing for the winter time? Anything exciting? Uh, yeah, no, I, I have been reflecting. I have a deep reflection here because this is going to be philosophical. Huh? Be careful. Probably right time of the day. Uh, when you speak about COVID and all of a sudden all corporate decided that it's miraculous because people can work from home. So the mayor, the mayor, of course, it's not because they can work from home. It's because you can save money because you can decrease the footprint of your corporate organization by reducing desk and so on and so forth. So here comes the mm. money. You say, mm, looks interesting. So corporate are thinking of what is this future of work or the hybrid working that we would like to adopt in the, uh, in the future. And they say, what, how many desks do we need to have? And also you can think about, you know, open plan area or those private offices, you know, those little pods when you can be on your own and uh, do a Zoom call or something like that. And of course, you can have a, a, a system that is totally non-flexible, like in the past when everyone had this little pod, or you can think of something totally flexible when everyone can move around. So you have this sort of mix, those two axes, and you can think all the possibilities in between uh, being accessible. And don't and therefore they say, what are we going to do with this? And therefore they say, oh, we are going to create a little team or as people do a survey, what they would like to do and we will implement that. All fine. You see the perfect projects, except that you realize that, yes, guys, but you know, some people may have studied <laughs> the best way of sitting employees around. You know, what, what is the chance that you can improve the overall productivity of your employee by getting a nice setting or proper setting by, you know, something like someone that do the proper studies. And it has been done, of course, because I imagine most of you know the uh, Thomas Allen's curves, uh, which is the frequency of, uh, of bumping into each other, depending on the distance between the desk of the people. Mm -hmm. And it has been studied and over study over the years, and it proved to be right. But then you say, yes, it was in the 1970s. So is it still true today? Because by now there is Zoom, there is emails, there is whatever. And by chance, the... Uh, Thomas Allen did exactly the same study in the early 2001 mails and things like that started to happen and you realize that mail did not change the behavior of the people. You tend to email people that you have already met in your office in the first place. You just don't do call emails like you were not doing cold phone calls to your colleagues like back in the past. So somehow being close together in the office still matter in the early 2000s. Nowadays, no one has done more studies, but imagine it still matter to some extent. So you can see that this whole project of reorganizing or reorganizing the corporate world is all driven by goodwill, but they are forgetting the knowledge that is uh, existing on all of this, because of course people are not always aware of this. And then I realized that uh, I remember this quote from uh, Albert Einstein that you may have heard or, or, or not heard that imagination is more important than knowledge. And uh, therefore I say, what, what, is it true or is it not true anymore? You know, is imagination really more important than knowledge in whatever you do in those business? And then I went to look over the internet. And the next sentence on this one is, imagination is more important than knowledge. And after Einstein state, because knowledge is limited. And of course, in 1930, you can imagine all oh, knowledge was free flowing across the world because ultimately you access to the books in your library and you were limited by your capacity of reading or finding information within those books. So yes, clearly knowledge was limited. But nowadays, with my smartphone, my knowledge becomes unlimited as soon as I have a bit of time, you know, finding the right information. So in this world, when knowledge is unlimited, is imagination more important than knowledge? I'm not sure. You know, mm, no, I disagree. I disagree <laughs> with that. I, I do. And, and I don't believe that knowledge, you have endless information available to you, but you don't have knowledge. Knowledge is the understanding of the information presented. And even with a book, you have to, you have to take in that information and then think about it for it to become knowledge. You've I got to say, apply your experience and wisdom to it. My, my point is you can find that book easily for nowadays. You see what I mean? Oh, no, read. I understand that. And, and so yeah. it allows you to develop knowledge a lot faster. But it's, you know, that's, it's an argument I get into people an awful lot. The internet doesn't have any knowledge in it. It has information. Yeah. Uh, the knowledge gets created between the two, between your ears when you see that information 
and you actually cognitively process yeah, it. But, but let, let Stefan uh, finish it. Yeah, I'm sorry. But, I, no, I, no, it's all fine. I agree with I you. I hijacked. I, I, I'm I, sorry. But, no, no, I fully agree. You're right. Uh, of course, it's information. Knowledge is when you process that information. We are fully online on this. There is no discussion. But at least nowadays, you can access, like, for example, a PDF of a book. You can have it in something like 30 seconds. Like in the past, you say, okay, I'm going to plan my day to the library. I need to find that book just to realize that someone else took it two hours before you and that you will have to wait two weeks to get it back. So, you know, all those things have really uh, decrease your uh, access to this information and this access of information becomes knowledge when you take the time to do it. So it's still limited by your own time and your own brain processing. We fully agree. My point was, yes, so it, it changed a bit this 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 uh, business that nowadays yes imagination is really important it's still probably more more important than knowledge to some extent, but when you can build excessively some knowledge it's probably good also to check and not just rely on imagination because you are probably have a good chance to reinvent the wheel, which is exactly what happened now in this future of work business you know how many corporate are not going to look into what is known into the, that type of area. Why basically you could say I spent you know a day on on uh, uh, internet and absorbing this information and I can have a more elaborate project or you know better informed project. Let's put it that way, better informed. And then you say yes, in this case, imagination is more not more important. Is making sure that you have checked what the knowledge of the humankind is because you can you are going to reinvent the wheel and basically did not realize that people have worked a lot before summarize it and put it, this information really accessible to you. So you can see that technology has shifted this balance between you know, how much imagination you need and how much time you spend to have to, to acquire the knowledge on this one. And this is interesting to see how it's going to change some of the way we are working, because the more information there will be, maybe there will be too much information. And that's when you're finding the right information is going to be tricky. Because I, I was seeing that IBM predicted that human knowledge will double every 11 of 12 hours in the future, in the near future. I was not sure if it's true. It looks like unbelievable when you take that for uh, a system. But all that knowledge that we are accumulating and getting accessible to or information, it will change the way we are working, definitely. And it will increase very really fast with you know the Internet of Things and all those things. So this isn't a uh, you know, philosophical concept. Is at one point, how much time we'll have to spend to check out the knowledge that has been already created by humankind because, you know, 99.9% .9 of the case, someone may have already thought of that and already create a solution. And I will probably should increase my percentage. 99.9999% of the time, someone else on earth will have solved your problem. So I get a lot of thoughts on this. Ah, thanks. <laughs> I get a lot of thoughts on this. Because like you, uh, uh, Stefan, you know, I, I contemplate these things quite a bit. You know, what is... What is data? What is information slash knowledge? What is wisdom? All right. You know, data are just points of, of nuggets of, of information. I shouldn't say information, nuggets of facts. Data is data. Yeah, data is data, but data is based in, in, in facts. You know, information is data in context. And, uh, uh, and wisdom is uh, the, what you have gained from, from using knowledge. You know, they say that uh, uh, wisdom is the, or experience is the uh, toughest teacher. It gives the uh, lesson first and teaches the lesson afterwards. Um, so I think about this. And if we think about, you know, just recently, or recently, I hate, keep on bringing this up, you know, the COVID, you know, what was presented as facts and what was presented as what we know, okay, what the, that knowledge was, has proven time and again to be, wrong or contradictory or they have doubled and tripled uh, over themselves that it was one way then it was another so <clears throat> i think that what we have to do is we have to be slower to pass judgment on the information the knowledge that we're ga uh, gaining and keep on using the uh, imagination to question what we think we know Okay, because uh, I think what I believe that what we know is not nearly as much as we think we know. I think that collectively the human race uh, uh, has a tendency to climb Mount Stupid. 
uh, where they, they think they know more than they do. They're absolutely positive of some position. And then, oops, they were wrong. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, getting back to your, your work, I have this conflict. Um, you know, I like high performing teams and I have a problem with believing that high performing teams can sustain that level of performance over time if they don't meet face to face. Uh, you know, I'm not convinced. I don't, I, I'm not saying this is, this is a position. This is a concern. And I think that there's not enough time to have collected data in order to extrapolate out an effect that is going to be five years hence, as opposed to the two years we've already been in it. So, um, it, we're li living in very, very interesting times, um, where we're bombarded with information sometimes data. I think we get bombarded less with data than we do in information and people's interpretations of the data than we actually are raw data. But I think that um, uh, it's an interesting time because with all this information about so many subjects being thrown at us, we have to, I believe, be even more vigilant to question it and challenge it. I mean, you know, people talk about the science. There's no such thing as the science. There's just science, okay? There is a collection and anal analysis of facts uh, and uh, the outcomes are subject to question always, every time. I mean, there was a, a moment in history where we thought that the sun re revolved around the earth. A moment in history where we thought the earth was flat. Um, a moment in history when people thought that we didn't actually land on the moon. I mean, just all these different things. Um, and if we didn't have people, wise people, brave people, challenging that, we would have never made the progress that we have. So that's my two cents. I yield the floor back to Stefan. Thanks. I think we should discuss that around the beer. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I, think so. yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think so. It's interesting, but you see, your point is that's why it's interesting. Of course, the flat, the flat was uh, the the earth was flat, and you know the the, the sun was turning around the earth and all those things. But if you see this, uh, I think it's book, you know, Minster, whatever, or Fuller, Fuller, Buxmeyer, or Minster, whatever, I forgot his name, sorry about that. But the, the curve of knowledge, we have tremendous knowledge nowadays. You know, this is, I don't say that we have limited, uh, you know, unlimited knowledge, because of course we can, we can still lot to learn. But clearly, the amount of knowledge that we have nowadays makes a big difference to, to, to the way we are seeing the world. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, why don't we invite Sam to the bar here? What do you think? Yeah. Hey, Sam, you still there? I'm still with you. Awesome. Um, Welcome to the Outliers Inn. Welcome back, I should say. Thank you. It's good to be back. Yeah. I'm a bit disappointed that you're not securing any gummy bear beers for me, though. I feel left <laughs> out here. <laughs> okay, I'll see if I can throw another bottle in, in my bag, uh, and we'll have a, uh, 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 a little beer party. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Awesome. I didn't know you were a fan of beer. I know that Stefan is, being from Belgium, the uh, second best beer in the world. No, I'm, uh, I've, been a, I've been a craft beer fan for, well, be now I'm going to sound like a hipster, but before it was cool. Well, I, I've always <laughs> been a fan of the, uh, of the heavier beers, the, uh, the stouts, the porters, and uh, some of some of some of the the stronger ales. So the uh, you know the nine percent sounds about right for me. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, you know, the, I think Guinness though is, isn't that like a four point five? Yeah, the Guin the Guinness isn't very strong in alcohol content. It's yeah. uh, it's liquid bread, as some people put it. It's yeah. back in the days when that was the only dark beer you could get in most places. So I was a big Guinness drinker back in the days. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So. Um, uh, so how's it? You're what in uh, Sweden, right? Sweden. Yep. How, how's Sweden uh, treating you? I saw a video just a couple of days ago, and I know that you're south in Sweden, but these guys are like way up north in Finland, and the uh, the uh, northern lights were like in all their glory, and it was so cold that the snow was crunching. You know, very similar to where it is in upstate New York right now, where where you could hear it, you know, the, them taking the steps and it crunching and it looked really marvelous. So do you ever get a chance to see uh, the Northern Lights there? Not, not, not in the, um, not in the south, southern half of Sweden or extremely rarely. And uh, I mean, 
I'm a I'm a born city person, so I very rarely venture out outside of the metropolitan areas. Uh, so you wouldn't uh, with the light pollution, you wouldn't get to see it in all of its glory anyway. No, uh, no. I mean, it's funny because I have friends who are you know, expats living in Sweden, and yeah. one of the first things they do is to head to the north and see because it's 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 magnificent the north of Sweden in the winter. You know the the darkness, the northern light, the vast, relatively unspoiled wilderness. And then we have myself who've been living in Sweden all my life. And I'm like, nope, seems cold. <laughs> it's more like a, so what? Right. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I should I should probably see more of the country, but you know, you know how it is. It's uh, the, the tourists know more about your city than you do because you walk past all these things and you, you take them for granted. And the tourists are like, no, that, that building has great his historical value. And I'm like, it's in the way to get to the bus. <laughs> blindness. Yeah. yeah. So what's uh, what have you been up to here lately, Sam? Well, I mean... To spin off a little bit about what you spoke about, Joe, with the high-performing teams and the remote work, because that's obviously, you know, up my alley. I think that that's really been the, you know, the theme of the last couple of years and seeing how we're, how the teams are working with, how they're adopting their way of working and dealing with this. You know, how do you stay high-performing as a team when you don't have the opportunity to meet? How do you effectively onboard new team members? How do you effectively offboard team members leaving? And the, how do you, how do you build the personal connections? So so that's been my have you come up with any answers? It's compl complicated as well. It's really complicated. Uh, I don't, I don't have any simple answers because I think, well, it depends. It, I'm finding so, some people are dealing extremely well with it. To some, some people I've seen it's almost been a. It's been a boon in that they have fewer disruptions, they have fewer distractions from their work, and they're actually producing far more than they would have if they are sit if they were sitting together in an office. But some people really struggle with it. I guess myself, I'm on the fence. I miss parts of it. I miss, you know, since I do a lot of a lot of trainings, I know we have that in common. I think quite a few of us and do you know trying to read somebody's body language, trying to see if they are under, if they're really understanding what you're saying, if they're, they're just nodding along, hoping, hoping they will get it later. Picking that up online gets a lot harder. Yeah, I was, um, in fact, I even wrote an article about this uh, some years ago. I was in New Orleans. I don't know if you've ever been to New Orleans, Sam, but uh, David, I'm sure, Mule, I'm sure you have by now. Yep. But uh, in New Orleans, they have these jazz bands that play on the street. And they might have like uh, just a couple of uh, members in the band. They might have a dozen members in the band. And what I, I was watching or listening to this in both, watching and listening to this one band. And, you know, they would all come together. You know what I mean? Like they're all playing together. But then they would all go their separate ways musically. You know what I mean? That, you know, yeah. It didn't seem like they were playing together anymore, but they were. But then they would come back together again. And then, then they would separate. And it was really cool. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, Stefan was talking about imagination. You know, these people, when they separated, they're exploring their imagination, their creativity. Yeah. All right. But then they had to get back together again, you know, to share that creativity. But just, if nothing else, just to level set to make sure that they're a band still. Okay. Before yeah. they go off and do their thing again. So... If, if I were to think of a metaphor for uh, trying to get back together face to face, but also a hybrid approach where you al are also allowed to be creative separately, I think that's going to be the best mix at some time in the future. Um, there are, but there's some challenges there because some people need structure in order to be successful. They need to show up at the office every day. You know, they, they need their, uh, their, the confines of their in, environment to, in order, in order to be tethered to that environment. 
And there's other people that are, you know, like if I never see it, my coworkers ever again, then I'm going to be just as happy. Um, but I think there's going to have to be, and, and you know, I don't have the answers to this yet because I think it's way, it's way too early to, to know what's going to work. Um, and I don't think there's going to be any one answer completely. But I think that eventually we will come to some hybrid model. You know, wh whether people come together, you know, once a week, once a month, maybe combinations, like maybe team A takes the building on, on Monday, team B takes it on Tuesday, you know, uh, all the way to Friday. And they all get to, all the teams get together once a month for a day. I, you know, I don't know what the, the answer to that is, but I think it's really going to be important to work in some real physical face-to-face -face in order to create and maintain, you know, um, a high performing team. What do you I think, think Sam? I think you're raising actually two really interesting points here, Joe. I think the first one, which is perhaps where we are looking, where we're going with future organizations, is that organizations are going to have to decide, you know, are, they, are they trying to build a jazz band or a classical music, music orchestra? Yeah. In that, you know, because just like, you know, the jazz band can sort of, you know, drift away doing their own thing and then come back to a common theme. And if you're not a jazz fan, it's going to seem a bit odd, but, you know, you can't ever argue that they're, they're you can't argue that they're not in control that they don't know what they're doing you know they they know exactly what they're doing and sometimes it just seems a little bit chaotic so and some companies are are, are going to be organizing like jazz bands which you know with high performing but loosely coupled teams with a lot of autonomy and they're going to have to recruit people based on that whereas i'm sure other organizations will try to maintain the you know the more classical orchestra where you have the conductor in the front and everybody's in their place and everybody's trying to perform, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony to perfection. And there is no room for, for spacing out. There's no room for exploration during the performance. Your, your job is to execute to perfection. But I think today we're just kind of, oh, we're, we're doing everything because everything is important, right? We're, we're creative, but we're also highly structured. And, you know, we need to be innovative, but we can only be innovative within our very strict rules. I think that's going to be the challenge for a lot of organizations. Then, no, it, it, the second, oh, I have to raise this because I, I think, you know, maybe we can have Mule and Stefan join in on this one as well, because this seems to be a, a topic that interests all of us. But uh, because the, the word hybrid gets thrown around a lot now, you know, the, the or matrix or matrix. Oh, yeah, the matrix. What is yeah. the matrix? And to some extent, I'm, I'm a bit worried about this because I feel one of the big advantages with the whole remote work, it's not just for the company, it's for, the enti it's for entire countries that we, we, have, we, are, we have huge parts of the country where it's getting really hard to live because there is no industry, there, there's no way for people to make money. And these are, you know, these are beautiful parts of the country, you know, these, these scenic landscapes, there's clean air, clean water, unspoiled, well, relatively environment. And nobody lives there because there is no work. And one of my hopes with the, with the change with remote work is that it might open up that people can actually live where they want to be. If, if you want to live you know, in, the, in, the, in the, family, the family farm, you can, and you can still work as a designer in New York due to remote work. The it depends model. on the work. Yeah. It yeah. depends on the work because, you know, uh, if I want to create a uh, metal object, all right, I got to have a machining center. I got to have somebody, a machinist standing in front of that machining center to make that part. Uh, I've got to, you know, if I'm actually making physical things, if I'm processing meat, if I'm processing produce and vegetables or food or anything else, I've got these physical processes. I've got people that have to uh, process goods through the warehouses. And so you're know, depending on the work, you know, if you're uh, creating software or you're creating marketing, yeah, you know, you could, you could be remote, but there's a great, there's a huge amount of work that really you need to, even if it's knowledge-based engineers need to be, you know, have access to the production line to be able to solve problems on the production line. But I've got another thought process too about this. And, and it's the, 
the idea that you can bring people together physically and they're going to collaborate and that doesn't magically happen. Uh, I've got a uh, example, uh, a group of people, about 12, 14 people, they're all working in the same space, but they don't have proper leadership. And because they don't have proper leadership, the collaboration that was expected out of putting these people together and the productivity that was expected is not getting delivered. And that's because of a lack of leadership. And so there's so many, you know, yeah. Do you have the right leadership in place? Do you have the right proximity in place? And is it a role that I need to be able to bounce ideas off of people? And how difficult is it for me to just have a quick idea bouncing conversation with somebody who's just down the hall than it is for me to get on a Zoom meeting with them to have that same conversation? Right. There's, there's another challenge that hasn't been raised. And I think it needs to be raised. Um, you know, basically the, the people that are going to be able to work remotely are the knowledge workers, okay? The people that are not having to become kinetic with, kinetic with, their, with their work mm -hmm. activities, all right? And the risk there is that you establish a, a, an elite in an underclass, okay? I don't know if you remember the Star Trek episode where you had the sky dwellers and then you had the Froglodytes or whatever it was, and the miners, um, yeah, and they became stupid because of uh, of the gases, um, and uh, uh, and in the elites were becoming uh, able to self indulge and become wiser, and it actually created a, a chasm between the two, a schism between the two, um, and so I would be worried. I mean, there's a we're only two years into this, all right there is going to be a lot of an, a collection and analysis of information uh, that's going to be necessary for any of this to become wisdom. Okay. We haven't been, we haven't been had enough experience to become wise on it yet. There's uh, going to be a lot of information that's going to come about and there's going to be a lot of uh, ideas coming at, around about it that through the socialization process, we're going to determine that some of this stuff is bullshit. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to, you know, the, the, the best people are going to be the people that are always looking at the risk profile. Why <laughs> won't this work? Not that this, oh, this, this work in a, in a, a lab and therefore it's universally uh, applicable. And, and um, Sam also mentioned about the difference between a, uh, a jazz band and an orchestra. OK, maybe this is actually what it comes down to uh, being corporate culture. OK, think about an employee, you know, the young upstarts, you know, even Facebook in the day, Microsoft in the day uh, before they became orchestras, they were jazz bands. OK, uh, until they had to put uh, increasingly amounts of increasing amounts of structure in place in order to make sure everybody um remained aligned to what I, you know, they don't know, but they're aligned to a conductor. Um, so I think that, you know, as an employee, we have to try to figure out, do we want to work for a jazz band or in a jazz band, or do we want to work in an orchestra? All right. And then organizations have to uh, determine whether or not they're going to be successful because of the, the, the raw force and brawn of there being an orchestra or the jazz band. But you know the thing about being in an orchestra, once you're institutionalized, your innovation and your imagination drops perilously because now you have committees you know, giving you the thumbs up or thumbs down on any uh, thought that might, be, uh, that might percolate. So you know, it's good. We're, going to, we're living in some really fascinating times you know, societally and, uh, and within our work environments. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over the next 10 years. And I think it's going to take 10 years before a reasonable body of knowledge is, uh, is established as a foundation for the human dynamics. I think it's going to regress to the mean. <laughs> but what is the mean? We'll never know, right? That's right. That 10 years. Yep. I, you know, you, you guys, when you started to talk about uh, orchestras and jazz bands, I started to just think about different kinds of rock bands. And, you know, we have 
uh, the rock bands out there that are known as jam bands, you know, Fish and and the the uh, Grateful Dead. And th- then you look at other forms of music or other popular music where there's no way that they could be uh, that uh, fluid in their delivery. Uh, you name any of the most, uh, you know, the rappers or any of the uh, popular you know, acts today, Katy Perry. No, they're, they are heavily designed music, heavily authored music, but you get to the jam, to the jam bands and they are very fluid. They know where their entry point and their exit point is, and they have the freedom to let them go around and play with each other, but they know where they're going to come back a certain uh, precision necessary in certain forms of music and a the lack of precision in others it's fascinating the the you know the analogy to it and it, it's making me now think about some of my clients going hmm they're more of a orchestra than they are a, a jam band you know they're the oh. eagles they're not the grateful dead <laughs> for me I'm, I'm that little monkey that you with, with the symbols <laughs> that's <laughs> that you see <laughs> so yeah. Well, uh, Sam do you, and Stefan, do you have uh, anything to contribute on? It's a fascinating little conversation there. I think uh, you used an example there, Mule, which I think was really interesting. We're talking about pop artists, you know, the, the really popular ones, which are sort of manufactured music. And, uh, you know, I think it kind of highlights one of the, uh, you know, one of the organizational, I guess, risks we've talked about where, you know, you basically have committees and specialists, you know, designing the most appealing product, but they're, they're really not creating anything new. They're sort of refining, you know, the, and reiterating the same message in a new packaging, you know, the new Fast and, Fast and the Furious, what is it, 15, mm-hmm. it's another movie with big muscular guys and fast cars, you know, they're... Or just a new and improved anything, you know, yeah. new and improved dish soap or whatever it is. And I think that that's, that, that might be a risk for a lot of organizations that it, it's very appealing because in the short run, those products, those, you know, that manufactured music is probably going to be quite successful, but you're also leaving yourself open to be disrupted because you're only really doing the same thing over and over again with slightly different flavors, purple gummy bears. <laughs> Purple, green, red. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you think, Stefan? Is there something like a purple gummy bear? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> 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 no, it's good discussion. I agree with the, the statement that, yes, the body of knowledge is probably not there at the moment. And uh, as a consequence, we will experiment. And, you know, of course, the people that will find the right formula the first one would be the successful or maybe not the first one you know the, 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 the you know the people that will adopt the right formula the faster will be successful right. you, you, know, you you bring up a good point there stefan usually it's not the inventor of the technology that becomes famous and wealthy it's the people that come afterwards you know you think about you know 3d printing we were talking about earlier you know the people that came out with that um you know had their vision and you know they delivered on their vision but they're limited by their vision you know they they didn't see beyond it uh where they were you know this happens time and again and usually the people that are successful are the people that come in the second wave i i also think that the you know the hype curve plays into this yeah you you have a new technology that comes out uh it has all these potential benefits and that's the hype and the hype and the hype and the hype until you pop the bubble of the hype and you go into that valley of discontent or disillusionment. Well, it didn't pan out the way that it did. And then that second wave, as you were talking about, Joe, comes in that second wave that finds the actual uh, practical applications for that technology. And yes, it might have been a, it might have been identified on the upward slope of the hype curve. But it's what survived the, the fall from right, the top right. of the hype curve. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's going to be fascinating. I still think that, you know, every time that a new technology comes out and somebody says, yeah, this is going to change the nature of work. Um, yeah, it does, but not dramatically. It's not as dramatic change. as they thought. Yeah. No, Remember change. several years ago, um, all the hype leading up to the release of the Segway. Yeah. I mean, everybody was like, you, no, nobody knew what it was and the hype behind it and all the investors and everything else. They said it was going to transform the way people were going to you know, transport themselves. Everybody was going to get on this thing. And, and it, it came out and I was like, that's it. <laughs> you know, it was like, but, you know and, what? And in fact, I think they stopped making them. Yeah. What, um, you know, because uh, the inventor of the Segway is also the founder of First Robotics, which is the you know, the sponsor of the robotics program that I, I mentor, uh, you know, global organization, there's, you know, 250,000 kids that are competing in the FRC this year. So it's, it's not a uh, small event. And um, the segue was a way to generate some additional revenue because it was really based off of his uh, concept designs and for a uh, more mobile wheelchair, a wheelchair right, but, that could climb but still, stairs. But it still didn't uh, live up to the hype. I mean, no, it never like, did. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it, you know, the inventor never considered that it was going to live up to most oh, of the hype. Come on. No, no. Well, he, he, that's not what, that's not what he published. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, listen, you know, we've been uh, here at the end and, uh, you know, for quite some time, I think uh, we should wrap it up. Yeah, you guys uh, have so. any uh, final thoughts there, Sam or Stefan? Uh, not from my side. Thanks a lot for the for the beer. I'm looking forward to it. And yes. thanks for the discussion. <laughs> my pleasure. Yeah, it was our pleasure. And Sam, I'll, I, I won't forget you either. I appreciate it. So I have a, I have a par parting question and we can mull it over until next time we meet maybe. Because Joe, you spoke about the risk with remote work, you know, becoming an elitist caste society, you know, the people who can work where they want to, and, you know, the people are sort of locked down to where the physical state, you know, where, where the physical work can be done. And um, aren't, aren't we heading there already, remote work or not? A handful of, a handful of people at maybe 15, 20% can pick, I mean, we're all doing pretty well for ourselves, I'm guessing, because we have the luxury of sitting here and doing podcasts on our Monday evenings. And to and a lot of people are you know working two or three jobs just trying to stay afloat. So I mean I'm Swedish. You get a little bit of that pseudo socialist propaganda in the end. I think it was a worthwhile. It popped into my head when you when you used that example that maybe we're heading there regardless of if we can work remotely or not. Well, I I think that would be a great uh, topic for the next uh, uh, outliers there, Sam. So. Uh... Absolutely. I, I think about it often. You know, I think you know, here I am in America and I see the divides and I see the schisms. I see them getting greater and greater. Um, and, uh, you know, what I worry about and David, you work in warehouses, usually mm -hmm. not the uh, usually the warehouses where all the used desks end up. Nobody buys a, a new desk for the warehouse. You know what I mean? It's always in the corner uh, offices and then the cubicles, but the, the desks get, uh, you know, eventually dumped into the warehouse. And so, you know, I see this um, already and I think, that it, I think there's a lot of risk in it. Um, but on the other hand, this is not to say that I'm trying to limit anybody's potential, their earning potential. And, you know, it's like, I will not, take from somebody in order to build something else up. You know what I mean? And if you think about capitalism in general, nobody got, got poor by capitalism. You know, uh, you, you might've made a bad bet, but you never got, you know, more people have been lifted out of poverty than not. Um, however, we can't forget, um, you know, where we came from. Those that make us successful are the people that are turning the wrenches. You know, they're, they're making our dreams a reality. We cannot discount that. And I think it also is a misplaced emphasis on higher education, but we, that's a, this is all a great, great uh, subject matter for, I think, for our next one. What do you think, uh, Mule? Well, I think so. I, you know, it's, it's, you know, how much, how much of, how much knowledge 
what's that ratio between knowledge worker and wrench turner? I, I, I'll give you an example out in the trucking industry. There's a, a truckload carrier that, you know, truckload carriers do this. It's how many people sit in the offices versus how many people sit behind the wheel. And they look at that driver to office ratio. And the more, uh, the more drivers, the higher the driver to office ratio is, the more uh, efficient the operation is. And so, you know, are there ways to look at some of the other industries? I think it's, it's would be fascinating to look at it from an industry point of view yeah, also. Let's, uh, let's make sure that that's a topic for our next one. Thanks for, yeah. for that, Sam. We'll make sure you're, uh, you're on the invite list. And you too, Stefan, because I always appreciate your in- insights. Yeah. Well, (laughs) you've spent another, you know, about an hour or so or over an hour, uh, you know, perfectly good day wasting your time with us here at the Outliers Inn. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, and, you know, I I didn't do so bad given none of my kit was with me for this uh, for this session. Right. So uh, that's true. So so listen, there's only one thing left. Uh, Don't drive like my brother. Uh, Don't drive like my brother. Especially the snow here. Cheers. (laughs) Bye-bye. been listening to another episode of the outliers in with your hosts joseph paris and david schneider this program is produced by the operational excellence society and sponsored by zonatech consulting group international